Dr. Richard Miller. The mission of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics is to expand consciousness, stimulate thought, enhance mental and physical health, and encourage community. Today, I'm delighted to tell you that as our guests, we're going to have Bernadine Dorn and Bill Ayers. Many of you are already familiar with their names. We're here in part because Bill has a new book called Demand the Impossible. You're going to want to read it and you're going to, going to find out how to demand the impossible. Bernadine Dorn was hired by the prestigious law firm of Sydney, Sidley Austin, actually, from 1984 to 1988. She went on to be hired by Northwestern University School of Law. Recently, she's been on numerous human rights committees, and since 2002, she served as a visiting faculty member in Amsterdam. Her legal work has focused on reforming the much criticized juvenile court system in Chicago and on advocating for human rights at the international level. Bill Ayers has been on the faculty of the University of Illinois. He's now retired. He's the author of, author and editor actually, I've heard him say that, of up to 30 books. Some of them are Public Enemy, To Teach, The Journey in Comics, Race Course Against White Supremacy, Teaching the Taboo, Teaching Towards Freedom, Teaching Towards Democracy, The Kind and Just par Parent, Fugitive Days on the Side of the Child, Teaching the Personal and the Political, The Good Preschool Teacher, and To Teach. The book we're going to be talking about today is Demand the Impossible. Of course, I would be remiss if I didn't also add that they're well known for their activities as political activists. Many of you are quite aware of the fact that they were seminal leaders, if not the founders, of the Weather Underground organization, and they were active in it from hmm, 1965, perhaps, when it was still part of SDS, they'll correct me if I'm off a little bit in the dates, until 1980, when they turned themselves into the United States government for their activities. Neither of them were ever prosecuted for ever of those activities. Welcome to Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. I love your introduction. That's so beautiful. Thank you for having us. Well, thank you. That's a nice compliment because you've been introduced so many times in so many places. <laughs> <laughs> also, I can see you read the book, which is an amazing thing. You have lots of markers in Bill's book. I've read the book carefully. I've uh, read a lot about both of you. It's a privilege and an honor to have you here today because you're very courageous people. Regardless of one, uh, whether one agrees or disagrees with what you've done, you're obviously very courageous people. I want to do something a little different for you today because you've been interviewed so many times. And so often, as I see, the people on national television who, inf uh, who introduce you and then they, they, uh, they interview you, all they want to talk about is uh, your activities as political activists, they don't seem to want to talk about the substance of your work. They want to debate with you over such things as whether you really were terrorists or whether you were, in your words, extreme vandals. And they want to go back and forth parsing words and they're trying to label you and label you and label you. But they're not talking about what you've been about in recent years. And what you've been about is education political activism, and now this great book. Thank you. Bill, what would you like to talk about? I'd like to talk about being a father and a grandfather and the partner of this wonderful person for 44 years. I mean, you know, it's interesting. I wrote the second memoir I wrote was called Public Enemy, uh, Confessions of an American Dissident. And when I started to write it, I had no idea where it would take me. But I was writing about the years from 2000 and, uh, 2000 and no, really from, from about 1975 to, to 2012. 
And what I discovered is that I mostly wrote about being a teacher and a parent, because that's mostly what I've done. That's I mean, who you've been for those years. That's who I've been, but sure. it's also where our activism has been. I mean, a lot of what powers us to get out of bed every morning and to fight the power is the, the, the recognition that what we're leaving to our children and grandchildren is out of balance, out of kilter, a kind of a mess, and we have some responsibility to clean it up. So we still get up every day determined to change the system. You've got a, a kind of conundrum in your life, which I'm aware of, and that is because of your early political activity when you were kids, actually, you're celebrated, which has given you a voice. Therefore, when you come forth with the voice, as you have on national TV, instead of talking about what you want to use the voice to talk about, demand the impossible, right. all these books you've written about education, what they want to talk about is the stuff that you got celebrated for, which is the problems with the government and so on and so on. When I don't, I'm going to try and not do that today. I appreciate that. That'd Thank be you. Great. I would like to ask to begin with, we're here broadcasting from Mendocino County, approximately 80,000 people. 20% at least of our county are on social welfare. Suppose you two came to this county and I was able to give you a wand and I say, you're now in charge of education for the county. Tell us some of the things you would do for our county if you were in charge of education. How would you help us? Well, the first thing I would do is I would say education is a human right. It's not a product to be sold at the marketplace. And this is part of the great national debate. What is education? Nobody ever raises it in those stark terms. But if you listen to the last six secretaries of education, if you listen to the new secretary of education to be, Betsy DeVos, they think of education as a product, something that's bought and sold at the marketplace, something that produces winners and losers. I would argue in the first place, let's start a conversation in this county, in this state, about the fact that education is a human right. One of the implications of that is that what the most privileged and powerful people and the wisest people have for their children should be the baseline of what we want for all of our children. In other words, yeah. make the best what the baseline That's is. That's exactly, exactly right, correct. because we it's not one of those areas where we don't know what the best is. We can see it. Small classrooms, highly prepared, well-paid, rested teachers, possibilities of the arts, education both inside a school but outside a school in the community. That's what we want. We want, a, a, we want our children to be able to find themselves, whether it's inspired by reading books or science or arts or community engagement. And we want that for everybody. I think in a county like this, that seems eminently possible, doesn't it? Well, I would hope so. But in fact, what we really have, as you too well know, is an educational class system. Exactly. Right? Exactly. We have a, a lower, a middle, and an upper. Exactly. And that's what we have throughout all of our society. And so it's hurting us at the educational I'll give level, you an isn't it? an example of this in Chicago, of course, which is huge, a huge city. Our mayor closed 50 schools on the south side of Chicago in the African American community in Chicago, 50 schools. And then he turned around and he hired a thousand police officers. So he didn't have the money to keep these schools open, but he had the money, in the, apparently, to hire a thousand more police officers. That shows you where he thinks the city is going or where he thinks parts of the city are going, right? They need to be policed, they're a danger, they're a threat but we're not doing schools, we're not doing education in the community, and we're certainly not doing what the north side of Chicago has. Okay, well, now I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna want you to dig in on some of your demand the impossible mm. ideas, because people are listening right now and they're saying, okay, sure, at a place like Sidwell Friends in, in, in Washington yeah. where the president's kids go to school, exactly. they have a ratio of one to 15. That's and right. the south side of Chicago, you probably have a ratio of one to 25, 30, or 35, 40. or 40, yeah. thank you. So if we were to make the schools all have a ratio of one to 15, like those at the very top 1% get, how do we pay for it? 
Well, the question of how to pay for it is a second question. The first question is, should we do it? I think you agree that we should do it. And then we get to the question of how do we pay for it? Here we are in the richest country in the world, in the ri and we live in one of the richest cities in the richest country. Our grandchildren went to public school for, I don't know, the last eight years. They fired the music teacher five years ago, and the parents rallied and raised money and hired a music teacher. Then they fired the art teacher, and the parents rallied and raised money. Then they closed the library. And last year, our granddaughters had to bring their own toilet paper to school. Now, this is absolutely a way to ruin um, any sense of education as a human right. So let's talk about how to pay for it, but let's first agree that it's what we want. Bernadine raised our illustrious mayor. Let me just add a point. The mayor sends his kids, like the Obamas send their kids to Sidwell Friends, the mayor sends his kids to the University of Chicago Laboratory Schools. That's also where Arne Duncan, the former Secretary of Education, sends his kids. Now note, Arne Duncan was in charge of the Chicago Public Schools for seven years. Then he was in charge of the nation's public schools for seven years. But when he came back to Chicago, he couldn't find a single public school for his kids. So for 14 years, he's been telling the rest of us that we should settle for uh, constant standardized testing. We should settle for no arts. But when it comes to his children, no. So this is where we have to raise a demand, goes right to your point about a lower class educational system, an upper class and a middle class. We want what they have and we deserve it because we're all part of a democracy. Anything less than that Anything less than having what, as a baseline, what the most privileged has undermines and eventually destroys democracy. So that's where I begin the and conversation. Can I just add one word? As we've raised our three sons and now grandchildren, we're I mean, we're not raising them, but we're, we have a hand in it. Um, and, uh, you know, you see all these young people who, despite the denigration of teaching, despite the notion that we should automate it all, that we just need technology and the web, that we don't need teachers anymore, that teachers are the problem with poor test scores and so on. More and more young, brilliant people want to teach. There's a lot of people who are born with the, with the desire and the longing to be a teacher. And that's astonishing. That's something to tap. It means that we really do continually have people inspired about teaching and giving back. So they're there. And we have to figure out a way, I think, to match the resources that we do have, which are abundant, even, even in poor, small, rural counties. You see, one they're of the abundant. ways I know what you're talking about is possible is because I went to a school that's a product of Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson had a theory, he called it embers in the ashes. Nice. What he wanted to do was create a grid of the entire United States at that time, make little tiny boxes. And in those little tiny boxes, he wanted to find students who really wanted to go to school. Mm -hmm. And then he wanted to send, make sure they went to school, regardless of how much money they had. Of course, in those days, only those who had money went That's to school right. of any kind. He wanted to send them all to school. I went to a school that was an outgrowth of that hundreds of years later. It was called Stuyvesant High School in New York City. Ah, sure, right? It yes. cost nothing to get in, but we produced more PhDs and Nobel laureates than any school perhaps on That's the planet. Right. Right. That's so exactly it proved right. to us that you could go to a school and get a great education if the city was behind it. Right? The, city also, the city also provided Bronx High School of Science and yeah. Brooklyn Tech. There were schools that cost nothing and yet you got a great education. So those are terrific examples, and I'll throw in a, a lateral example, because what you see there is in your, when you're living in a period when education is a human right, that you have a right to an education simply by being born, you can create schools which will work for all kids. And we see in New York City today, uh, schools in Spanish Harlem, for example, where our kids went to school when we lived there, are schools that are really forward-looking, they're small, they are organized around uh, at least in part, letting the kids pursue their own questions, their own curiosity. Because in a free society, if you want to create free citizens, at least part of the curriculum has to be following your own interests and asking questions of the universe. It has to be inquiry, curiosity. You have to foreground imagination 
and entrepreneurship and background discipline and obedience. But here we have a system in Chicago where what gets foreground is, is it foregrounded again and again is obedience and conformity. And what gets thrust into the background or disappeared is imagination, curiosity, and question asking. So that's a serious undermining of what we really need. Let me go to the question of money for just one minute because one of the things that I think you know and I think much of your audience knows is that we are a rich country and we do have money. The question we should be debating is what do we want to spend that money on? So if we have a trillion plus military budget and this kind of we've been sold this bill of goods about austerity and privatization that everything private is good and anything public is terrible, well we get stuck in the situation we're in where inner city schools are starving and the military is spending you know, obscene amounts of money on nothing. And so I think we have to, as a, as a society, as a people, challenge that, question that. The Roman government proved to us that you can't put legions all around the world and support them. <laughs> yeah. And so exactly what they did, and right. you know what they did, they switched over to the consciousness instead of the body and they created the Catholic Church, which then has spirituality around the right. world. It's much cheaper to put priests <laughs> right. around the world than it is to put legions of Roman citizens. Right. But Chalmers Johnson tells us that we've got 720 military bases. Exactly. You've been thinking about this your yes. whole lives. What happens if we close those bases? What happens to us? Well, we I learned think to we're be a freed up. I really I really think that we learn to be a nation among nations, you know. If you ask most of your listeners, well maybe people here are highly educated, what percentage are Americans of the world's people? Usually my students over the years have guessed wildly wrong. But okay, we're slightly around 5% of the world's people, a little under 5% now because every day it goes down. Right. And, uh, you know, that, that just suggests that instead of being the uber nation, instead of being the dominant nation, instead of being the only exceptional nation, we get a grip of our real history. And all around us, people are trying to tell us our real history. I mean, we have Standing Rock. We have Native people coming together around, from around the country in a unity that has never happened in the hundreds of years of American history of tribal nations of Native people around water. Water. This is what we, this is precious water. We all need water. Detroit needs water. Flint needs water. So, we, you know, no matter where, so that kind of a thing tells us a little bit, I think, about who we are. Or we have young people engaged, you know, rising up again, as they regularly do, around Black Lives Matter, telling us that we don't need a thousand more police officers in the city of Chicago. We need that money invested in the neighborhoods. But people would argue, Bernadine, that if we close those bases, we're going to get overrun. Other countries are going to attack us. Do you think so? No, it's a paranoid fantasy, actually. Is it? Yeah, and I, I think, think there's so. two things to note. One is that as the United States goes downhill uh, and, and is, meets serious competition as an economic power, and is losing its standing as a political and cultural power, it is rising as a military power. Now that's a very dangerous recipe, a, a, a declining economy and a rising military. I don't think, I think that if you look at the world from the perspective, as Bernadine was suggesting, of the world's people, they see us, when, when the American boot comes down, they don't see it delivering freedom, democracy, and human rights. They see it delivering death and destruction, and they don't like it. We are amazed as we travel around the world how much we are loved as Americans, even as the government is despised for its militarism. We think that if you closed all the military bases around the world and found a way to live as a nation among nations, spent that money on social welfare and human development, we would be a much safer country, actually. In yeah, the I think there's no evidence that it makes us safer to have military bases everywhere around the world. It really cultivates fear at home, and it cultivates fear among the people where we have a military base. So we used to say, imagine, just imagine for a minute that the Italians had a military base in the United States. <laughs> I'm, exactly. I'm exactly. glad they have restaurants. Here. Exactly. Yeah, that's the best thing. But <laughs> imagine an air us? base Could in you, the Adirondacks. But it's, un, it's yeah, unimaginable. unimaginable. And that came, it is came and yet, to mind because turned out that the, you know, during maneuvers in, in an American mar uh, military base in Italy, they, do you remember this? Some plane went into a ski lift and, un, and yeah. 100 people were killed there. 
that was a terrible accident. But the but psychological what aspect that? of what you're saying is yeah. really what's, what's so important. You, you important. can imagine any country having an army or an air force base in any state in our union. We would be totally freaked out. We'd be up in arms. We'd be, we would be, we literally would be up in arms. And that's how people feel in other countries, every country. But we don't have empathy that way, do we? We no. don't really put ourselves in the place right. of what it must be like in Germany or France or Italy or South America or exactly. any place and say, what is it like to have an American that's military right. presence there? And you they know, know who I think has the empathy? Many returning veterans. Uh -huh. That's correct. It's interesting because the vets that we know and work with um, who become veterans against the war really become veterans against the war you know it's hard to become anti-war in the heat of the war but when they come back home and reflect on where they've been and what they've done many of them come to feel like we weren't wanted we weren't wanted it was everyone was an enemy because we didn't know where we were That's or who right. we were we didn't know the language or the culture or the history of Iraq for example or let alone Afghanistan you know, this is another, if I, if I could, no, this is another sure. example of how privilege anesthetizes people. So Bernadine's saying we're under 5% of the world's population, and yet we don't know um, much about the rest of the world. So I was just in a liberal arts, a very expensive liberal arts college in the Midwest last week, and I asked the 50 kids who were at my lecture if they could draw a freehand sketch of Iraq and Syria and Yemen and no one could. Fifty very smart kids going to a very smart college, uh -huh. having a very American education. Bernadine and I were in Rwanda with her. She took her law students there at the 10th anniversary of the genocide. We were on a, in a high school on a hillside in a refugee camp, and we were introduced as being from Chicago, and a 14-year-old boy went to his work folder and pulled out a map a freehand sketched map that he had drawn and showed it to us. It was a map of the United States and he said, you're from Chicago, that's on the Great Lakes of North America, just like we're on the Great Lakes of Central Africa. And everyone who was with us said, does Central Africa have Great Lakes? <laughs> well, I mean, we're Americans, we don't have to know. But he's a kid in a refugee camp yeah. and he does have and to he know. Knows. We're going to switch the topic a little bit. I got the message about, about education here in Mendocino County. It's about having a conversation, if I understand you correctly, about what is education exactly. and who is it for and how we're going to provide it so that there's more of an equal playing field. And let's ask also, exactly. what is an educated person? Because I think we could have a deep discussion with that uh, yes. in your community. Yes. Uh, different than a high test score or a Henry Kissinger. That's an educated person. I don't think so. Yeah. I'll tell you a quick story. I gave a lecture at the University of Wisconsin about a month ago, and I hadn't been at that uh, campus for decades. And the first thing I noticed is that the classrooms look exactly the same. Namely, the students are all sitting, exactly. facing one person who is, and there, of course, it's teaching obedience and conformity exactly. by the structure of right. the classroom exactly. without even exactly. saying a word. Interesting. Let's talk about health care. Okay. Okay. Good. Yeah, let's talk about because the this three of the, the topics I've got to cover today with you. Health, this is education, and welfare. Great. Those are well, the Well, health topics. is the easiest. It's, it's obvious. We should have universal health care. It's totally obvious because it works wherever it is. And we, you know, had a huge health reform with Obamacare, right? So-called Obamacare. And, and hundreds of thousands of more people got some kind of health care. But it was a, one of those halfway measures that often happens. Uh, and, and so the insurance company stayed wealthy and as a middleman between health care right. and the receivers of health care. Uh, and, and so we're paying for a whole unnecessary layer of health care. And everybody who was doing these reforms, the Clintons first and then President Obama later, knows that. They know that. But they just can't get the will to take that out, to take out the middleman, to take out the insurance companies, to take out the inflated costs. They're trying to do it in steps. They're trying to do well, it in that's steps, how they that's see right. It, but but they... now we may f be facing a real step back. We're going to get to that uh, <laughs> definitely during this program. But okay. tell me, how would you see, tell us, tell our listeners, how does universal health care work in practice? How does it work? What well, do you, you do? Let's start with Canada or. Yeah. Scandinavia. Let's talk with Canada because um, it's easy start with to Canada. see. It's very simple. Um, you agree that health care is a human right. Once again, it gets down to fundamentals. Is health care, is healthiness 
a product? Is it something that can be bought? The rich get more and the poor get less? Or is it a human right? If it's a human right, then everyone deserves it. And if we start the conversation there, then we begin to say, well, how much do we need to tax ourselves in order to be sure that all of us are healthy? And frankly, I think if you take a step back and take a look at the big picture, everyone being in better health, both mentally and physically, makes the whole society better, makes my life better. So it's not so much a thing of me as an individual against everyone else, a war of all against all, but it becomes a cooperative matter. And so if we agree about that, then we look to Canada and we see I how mean, they can pay I, it. Can I tell sure. two stories? One is a friend of ours stayed at our house and was writing a book, wonderful guy. And he's a Canadian citizen now, and his kids and family are. And he came downstairs one day, and he saw us poring over, you know, social, <laughs> social security and Medicare, and Medicare, Medicare and our choices. forms. And we get, you know, we get all these envelopes we don't open, and then once a month we make ourselves open it and try to make sense of it. And with a, high, you know, four levels of higher education degree, you can't make sense of the billing <laughs> whatsoever. So you pay or you don't pay. He he stood there watching us for a while, and then he took out of his wallet a card you know, a like a credit, credit card. card. And he said, this is it. Glasses, eye care, dental care, hearing, health, health care. Mental health. Mental health, vaccinations, new baby, everything. It's one card. It's not chopped up into a million things. And I said to him, you know, I work at criminal court and juvenile court as my passion worked for the last 40 years. And I never see anybody wearing glasses, kids or young people brought into court. And he said, well, that's because they're not, they, you know, probably they can't see in class. There's no more any school nurse. When I was growing up, there was a school nurse permanently, full time in the school. She did eye tests, among many other things, about taking care of the whole school's health. But that's all gone, you know. So we don't have this kind of automatic assumption that we should check your eyes. We should check young people's eyes and old people's eyes. <laughs> and we, that should be a routine part of normal preventative health care. So I, I think it's so obvious that that's what we need. And that's it would because be you two believe that health care is an entitlement, that human beings yes, deserve right. health exactly. care. And you also believe, believe, believe that human beings deserve a decent, if not an equal kind of education. That's right. Exactly. And, and what about food, food and also. shelter? Do you food, think people shelter, do? Uh, are, yes, food and absolutely. shelter? Absolutely, definitely. And clean water. Because, because these are the things by which we measure our humanity. These are not things that should be uh, monetized or marketized. These are things that everyone deserves. And so we have to figure out how to do that in a shared way. The other thing we believe is we believe there is such a thing as society. We're not just autonomous individuals ricocheting around all by ourselves. If you believe that, then you get sucked into the idea that your, your uh, uh, safety, for example, depends on you owning a gun and defending yourself against everybody. But in reality, uh, public safety is a social need. And since we all need it, we should share it. It's like there are simple examples, you know, in Chicago, the city picks up our garbage. I want the city to pick up our garbage. It's socialist, I get that, but it's okay <laughs> because I don't want my neighbor to say, I think I'll opt out of the garbage program. I'll just let it pile up in the backyard. What is he gonna do, train the rats to stay on his side of the fence? No, this is a social problem. It deserves a social solution. Same with education, same with healthcare, same with housing. You know, where they've tried in other societies as well as in place like Salt Lake City, where they've said, you know what we're gonna do about homelessness? We're gonna get homes for people. That's an unthinkable idea in most of America. But it, think about it. In Salt Lake City, they save money on police, hospital, emergency room, because homeless people are given a place to stay. And it's a permanent place to stay. It's not you know, a, a place to crash for the night. And that takes care of the homeless problem. Yeah, you know, actually there's, there was an experiment done up in Washington that demonstrated that giving homes to the homeless is cheaper than letting them live on the street exactly. because the incidence of using emergency rooms exactly. and fire departments exactly. for their needs decreases so much that the money saved on the ERs and the fire departments is made up for by, the, by what it costs them and, in the and housing. And not to get too crazy, but look at the tragedy we just witnessed in Oakland with these young people looking for a place of, of shelter and living in a place that was not coded 
kid that had terrible electrical problems and all the rest of it. But but why were they there? Economic why, reasons. Exactly. Definitely. Why couldn't we, as a society, yeah. say we need livable spaces for artists? We need livable spaces for communities to form. And those things aren't out of reach. Those are demanding the possible. So the people who question what we're saying, who who question. Uh, offering health care, offering food and shelter, offering a great education. One of the ways they question, of course, is who's going to pay for it? Are you going to make everybody pay for it? Are you familiar with Peter Singer's concept of effective altruism? Yes. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? I love that. Terrific. You like I it? Love, I love I that. I visit it often, like. his website. T tell our listeners what your understanding of eff effective well, altruism one, is. The one, I, I, the one thing that I really like about Peter Singer is the the examples that he gives of looking, you know, approaching a stranger, a approximate stranger, as another human being and seeing them, seeing yourself in the mirror of that. And, and he gives many, many great examples where it forces us to think hard about what we value. He has an example of a guy who's, who's a, a unspeakably expensive sports car gets stuck on a railroad crossing and a train is bearing down on it and the guy is walking down the track he could switch the train but then it would hit a baby and which would you do and of course everybody would say well it's worth it but then you you stop and think about how we make choices that's a tougher choice than the one of the uh, person jumping into the lake with an expensive suit that's another one exactly <laughs> that's the other one he gives but 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 i think that i think easier to give up the suit <laughs> exactly. but he has this expensive car and a, yeah. and a child's life but in reality we we have these choices all the time we blind ourselves to these choices and in our blindness we do tremendously amoral and immoral things but Singer's asking us, and I think we would ask ourselves, to open your eyes that part of being a moral person, part of being a good citizen, part of being an activist, is certainly to begin by paying attention and opening your eyes to the world as it really is. Yeah, well, by the way, for our listeners, part of what Singer is also saying or advocating is for us to earn more so that we can give away more. That's exactly, exactly right. right. Use the most of your earning potential if you're one of those people who has a big earning potential so that you can give away more. I exactly. did a whole program on this, by the did way. You? Oh, yeah. Lovely. And it was, it was quite interesting, the examples of people In fact, doing he things. Has a list, right, of effective places to put your money. That's right. Yeah. So it doesn't get eaten up in administration yeah, and it goes exactly. directly to helping someone right. and saving their lives or, or and the right. lives of their families. Yeah. Do you think such a thing is, is possible? Could Absolutely. effective altruism, could Absolutely. we demand the impossible? Absolutely. I think that you know we get stuck in a short-term view that, that human beings are a certain way, but actually we surprise ourselves again and again. People can be great and they can be good, but it's a matter of creating the kind of social conditions where we can see what the good is and we can choose it. This question of taxation and, and spending on health care, everyone agrees. Every, if you take just a, a, a brief look at any society, all societies, all governments, all they really do is tax and spend. The real debate we ought to be having is tax whom, how much, and spend on what. When I challenge people to close the Pentagon and save a trillion dollars a year, people say, well, not the Pentagon. Well, why not the Pentagon? You know, that's a debate we could have. Do you want to spend on military, surveillance, incarceration, or would you rather spend on schools, health care, and guarantees of income? I go with the latter. The person who just said that, that he goes with the latter, is Bill Ayers. He's here with his wife, Bernadine Dawn, together. They're here on Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. We're talking about Bill's latest book, Demand the Impossible, and he's and Bernadine are both talking about ways in which we can demand the impossible. Let your mind go to things that you never thought were possible in order to consider the possibility of them being possible. If you don't do that, you're stuck in the old way of thinking, of course. You know, we were talking about health care, and we're about to be treated to a debate between Obamacare versus predatory health insurance industry, capitalism run amok. And that's not the debate I want to have. And that's why in Demand the Impossible, we say, let's get out of the frame that's given to us, Obamacare versus you know, the health insurance uh, companies unchained. Let's talk about free health care for all. And that's the kind of thing we want to change the frame so that we can have a real debate. Well, you're segueing us into a topic that I wanted to bring up, so here we are. Here we go. We've got a president-elect who is the antithesis 
of just about everything that you've been saying today, everything you've been advocating your entire lives. He appears to want to put up walls. He comes on as if he's a misogynist. We've heard a tape where he talks about openly grabbing women's genitals. Not that a lot of men wouldn't like to grab women's genitals and a lot of young boys wouldn't like to. It's that, first of all, we don't. But second of all, he has the audacity to say, I can do it because there's nothing they can do about it. Right. That's the predatory nature that he brings to us. And he says it out loud, doesn't right. he? Yes. And I think one of the things, we have grandchildren who have watched this election campaign. And, you know, millions and billions of children have listened to this now for two years, right? The campaign's gone on forever. And I'm not sure what they make of it, but I know that our grandchildren woke up the morning after the election and said to their mom, did the woman win? You know, they, yes. <laughs> and she said no, and they cried. You know, and they, they've, they've heard this. You can't, it's pretty hard to insulate, even if you don't have a TV on in your house. It's pretty hard to insulate children from what's going on when it's this kind of uh, media saturated for two years. And so they're, they're pretty much aware, I think, of what, what he stands for, what Donald Trump has stood for, and what it means. And I have to say, you know, our job is is shifting a little bit now. We're in it. We're I think we're responsible, all of us, to figure out how to resist. Kenneth it's Clark taught us in 1954 that children that are three years old are aware of racial that's, prejudice. That's right. That was the famous study that led to the integration of schools. He was a professor of mine. Three-year-olds are aware of what's going that's on. True. And so three-year-olds can be aware that the president-elect is a man who has stood before the country and has openly mocked a disabled person exactly. by moving his body as if he was a disabled yeah. person. That's right. That's who's going to be the president of the United States. And talked about, I mean, Chicago, one of the reasons we love Chicago is, you know, it's right now the population is a third African-American, a third Mexican-American, and a third white, so to speak white. Uh, <clears throat> isn't that amazing? So it's a city that really is, like California, reflects, you know, a tremendous diversity of who the American people are. And I, I think it's going to be quite interesting to see if, if the president-elect thinks that he can come into Chicago with federal forces and check Mexican-Americans' identity papers. Bernadine, at one time in your life you said that it's not enough to wring one's hands right. when there are terrible things going on around. Action must be taken. Action must be taken. And I think now our action must be to resist in community. We have to find out how we can protect, how we can resist, what a sanctuary city might mean in an active, creative, bottom-up way. Not somebody at the top turning our city into a safe place for people to live. The and financial sanctions are so great that cities are afraid, Bernadine, because the federal government is saying to the small cities, if you do this, we will cut you off. And the amount of the cutoff, I've looked into it, is so drastic it that is. the cities are afraid to create. And this is just one, just on the immigration issue. There That's are many correct. other issues as well. That's right, federal funding for schools and so on. Yes, I know, it, it's quite something. But in California, you have a legislature and governor actually looking at what that might mean if federal funding were withdrawn and looking at other places where they can find the money. I think it's actually a time for creative energy and we will not be bullied. We will and not creative. be threatened. That's our money that we send to the federal government. It's not his money. That's for sure. He doesn't pay taxes apparently. I think that's so a hugely <laughs> important point. I think that's a hugely important point. He's not a king. He's not a free agent. He doesn't exist in a vacuum. He's not starting from scratch. Black Lives Matter exists. Standing Rock exists. Undocumented and Unafraid exists. Women, are, that genie is out of the bottle. Women are not going back toward a second class citizenship. I think that we have all kinds of forces on our side and we should note that he ran as a bigot and a, and a reactionary and a fascist but that's not, he doesn't have free reign to just exercise that. We also have something to say in the matter. Standing up makes a difference now. I want to read a quote. I'm going to ask your opinion on this quote. I hold that a little rebellion now and then is a good thing, 
and as necessary in the political world as storms in the physical. Unsuccessful rebellions, indeed, generally establish the encroachments on the rights of the people which have produced them. An observation of this truth should render honest Republican governors so mild in their punishment of rebellions as not to discourage them too much. It is a medicine for the sound health of government. I love it. Thomas Jefferson. Exactly. I, I, I thought that's tell. what it was. We were about to but guess. you know, you know, it reminded me of two other uh, two other things. I don't know if you've ever heard the concept of anarchist calisthenics. Have you ever heard that concept? I haven't. I it's like a, it. It's a lovely yeah, idea. You would love it. It's a lovely you idea. Love but the idea is that history will call on us at some point to break some rules. And they might be big, big rules, but you won't be in any shape to break big rules if you don't break the little rules along the way. And I, I just think it's kind of a clever way of saying, look, history makes its demands. And we've seen again and again that it's fire from below that brings about real change. Lyndon Johnson didn't think up the Voting Rights Act out of his own <laughs> head, came from below. Franklin Roosevelt was not part of the labor movement and Abraham Lincoln wasn't part of the abolitionist movement. Fire from below forced these leaders to do the right thing when the right thing was required. That's our job, build the fire from below. So tell us some, describe some little fires that can be created around the country to resist, to rebel in such a way that it's within the structure of what we are. How can we learn from your experience and how we can do this in such a way that will be most effective? Well, well, we go ahead. No, you go. You go. Well, we I mean, for one is it's already happening. It's already so happening. young people are in motion, of course, and us old people should pay attention and see if we can be of any use in supporting them. I think that's our job. So the the movements that are already happening, you know, starting with Occupy Wall Street and and rolling on, or you can start wherever you want to start back, you know, with the marches in Seattle in '99. But these movements keep bubbling up from below. The fight for 15, minimum wages of $15 an hour. These are powerful, powerful movements that get started by some activists and then become a national movement. Now, he, he's asking for 25 an hour, by the way. I, I saw know. I saw <laughs> I know. But I, exactly. Because you're be, demanding why be the modest? impossible. <laughs> Let's be impossible. That's right. But, but, you know, I think that's right. We're always in the middle of things. It's never the beginning or the end of things. We're always in the middle. So Black Lives Matter has, you know, which is the current iteration of the centuries-old fight for black freedom, is, is very inspiring to us today. But given the election of Donald Trump, given the campaign he ran on, a Muslim registry, women uh, losing their right to their own bodies, um, you know, rounding up 11 million people and sending them out, and on and on, you know, the whole program. This is a time when we should be gathering, and we should be gathering in neighborhoods, communities, uh, workplaces, houses of worship, classrooms, and we should be television programs. And we should uh, television programs, free <laughs> spaces, and we should be asking ourselves, what does history demand of us now? And I think gathering together to have that conversation is the beginning of something really, really powerful. What does history and, demand of us now? Well, for example, what's our if there's historical a moment? I if mean, there's I think a Muslim every, registry. Yeah, in Chicago, we, we have the second largest population of. Arabs and Palestinians in the United States. So one question is, what do they want us to do? What is that community, which we know in Chicago, what do they want us to do? Here I would want to know what the most vulnerable farm workers and n undocumented people want us to do. But, because we can't act without knowing what, what the need is. But I think that there's many things that we can do to, ex to make an example of solidarity, including having spaces like universities, and colleges and schools and places of worship that are real sanctuaries, that we're saying this is a safe space. We're not having federal authorities come in here to get somebody. We're going to protect it. We're going to encourage it. We're going to have backup houses that are, are going to be safe houses where people can stay. I don't know what's going to happen, so I don't know what we're going to need. But I think thinking like that will help us figure out how to what's the need is going to be and how we're going to try to respond. So I step hear, one I is hear gathering. people, excuse me, I, oh, go ahead, go ahead. Well, with I was going to say, step one is gathering together, having this gathering, conversation, gathering. and then finding ways to mm -hmm. talk to other people who are gathering. But if I were to name this political moment, and we try to do this all the time, one aspect of it would be this. 
Paris represented the best international agreement we could have ever achieved in terms of reducing the catastrophe of climate change. And simultaneously, Paris is inadequate to the crisis that we face. And here we have a president-elect who said, I promise to tear up the Paris Agreement. I promise to drill and build pipelines and open up coal fields. This is a catastrophe. So what does history demand? It demands that we resist that. That we resist. You mentioned, you know, several times, and I hear so many people saying the same thing, Bernadine, about the young people. Mm -hmm. Why not the old people? Exactly. Why, why, should, why shouldn't the old people? <laughs> why shouldn't the old people? And I'll give you an argument why we should lead the way. Of course, yes. we have the less least, least to, to lose, lose. Well, exactly. and we also have social security to support us while we're doing <laughs> well, it. We should be leading the way. Yes, and what can and they do? Put we us, remember. I right? agree with that. I, but I think. You know why young why? people? Young people, because young people see their own moment, this moment, clearer than we do. We're, I'm stuck, I have to say, with seeing U.S. imperialism as it was in the 60s when I came of consciousness. And I think, you know, I, there's still truthiness to that. Yes. It's still sort of, of true. But it's different. It's different. It's a different world after 9-11. It's a different world with China as a major economic power in the world. It's different in a lot of different ways. A lot of countries that were colonies have, have freed themselves of that and now have different set of problems. Climate change we hadn't identified in that period of time. So I think that it's true that we should step up. And I agree. I'm for brigades of old people. Let us not be ageist. Let us line. not be ageist. But really. I think we should listen to, to the extent that they want us around listen to how they see the world. Here's That's what, I, what would, I'm I would add two things. I mean, I think you're right. Old people should feel engaged. And, and we get very impatient with old people who are nostalgic for a ship that already left the shore 40 years ago. Exactly. We think we're living now. We're part of this generation. That's all there is. That's this, all so, there is. Exactly. That's right. And we are so sharing true. the planet for a very brief blink of the eye. Yes. So we should think of ourselves as this generation. On the other hand, I was at a I was at a gathering of old of, of political people and it happened they were mostly old and somebody said why aren't there more young people here and my first thought was cuz it's so boring but then my second thought was to say what well do you go to the young people's meetings and he said are there young people's meetings <laughs> yes they are poetry slams they are you know performances they are many many things including political conversation about where we should go so let's not us isolate ourselves in old people's ghettos and let's get active. The reason the young are always the leaders in a revolution is because they come without the barnacles attached to them from years of years of living and they look at the world they're inheriting and they say, you gave us something that we are critical of. We're gonna put you on trial. We're gonna put everything old on trial and we're gonna try something new. It's our job to be with them, I agree. And even We to now know, by the way, that young people we know the brain science that says that young people are risk takers yeah. for better and for, for better worse. And but for in worse, social right. action, we would say for better. And they act in groups more than old people do. And I think those are two reasons why you know they're able to usually mm -hmm. be forward pushing. I think it's time that older people got out of their way of thinking of to act their age. That's right. I think acting your age <laughs> is a it's major problem. It's the worst thing. And it doesn't matter whether you're three years old or whether you're 80 years old. Sure. Acting your age is ridiculous. That's you exactly have to act right. how you feel and who you are, That's not right. what your age is, right? Exactly Otherwise, right. you're fitting into some stereotype or normal curve development of how you're going to be. You're exactly so true. Right. You, you mentioned several times this is a small point, but I want to mention it anyway because it stuck out when I was doing research on you, Bill, that you refer to us as a democracy. Why do you call us a democracy? I don't see that we're a democracy. We seem to be a republic, but not a democracy. We are more of a republic, and I, I use the word democracy aspirationally, and I use oh. it in the way that Students for a Democratic Society use democracy, and that is a notion of participatory democracy, a notion of economic democracy and global democracy. So I look to the to the speeches, for example, of Martin Luther King in the last several years of his life, where he was talking about democracy not as something we have, okay. but something that we aspire to. Fair enough. And, and we aspire to it not just in kind of political voting moments, but we aspire to it in, econ in the economy. We aspire to it as a, as a, um, as a global 
sure. world. So yes, we want to be, so we were just in Italy, and one of the things we did, it was a little bit unfair, we were kind of playing to the audience, but we said that either the United States should call, close all uh, of its foreign military bases, or everyone who lives in a country like Italy that has an American military presence should be invited to vote in the American presidential elections. <laughs> they yeah, all cheered cute. wildly. Yeah, you know, I brought that up because in reality, Hillary Clinton won, won by 2.6 million now votes, 2.6 million votes, 2% yeah. of the population. If it were a democracy, she would be the president of the That's United right. States. Well, and let's go further than that because a, a, a small percentage of potentially eligible voters actually voted. So we have voter suppression. We have the first election without the Voting Rights Act in 50 years. We have felony disenfranchisement. We have homeless disenfranchisement, and on and on. 40% of the, of the eligible voters voted, right? Exactly. So that means the person who won actually won by 20% of the population, it's that, one in five. It's that's not why we should resist. No, we should resist all the post-mortems that act as if some earthquake happened. Actually, what happened is, you know, a terrible, terrible campaign was run by Donald Trump. It did animate and bring together in a coherent way a fascist, racist um, formation. But mostly what Donald Trump did was had the Republican voters vote for him. And mostly um, yeah. it was a tiny minority of the population. Very important. I just want to say one area that we haven't talked about that I think is critical and is part of Bill's book is the prison population in the United States because there we are, number one in the world, uh, you know, with the largest prison population. In the entire world. In the mm -hmm. entire world. Yeah. It's unspeakable. And it's, you know, it's 2.5 million people who are in prison today, locked up behind bars, but then it's another. Six million. Yeah, another four something yeah. who are under surveillance in probation or yes. parole or in some form of criminal authority scrutiny. And this is an ex another example of when we say where are our resources going, why are they going? 30,000 at least prison? a year for every person we have incarcerated. It's so interesting you, that we would point the finger and say that's the kind of thing that goes on in one of those totalitarian that's countries, that's right. you know, right? Russia, China, where they put people away. Absolutely. And we have the highest number of people. It's extraordinary. Isn't that so interesting? So when, when we're looking for money, let's look at the Pentagon, but let's also look at our carceral state. And let's say we can be safe having almost all of those people out of behind bars and in some kind of community programs, some yeah. kind of p community scrutiny, some kind of assistance. So that's another place just to point. The prison system. You talk light. about it in your book. Read about it, folks. He calls it decarceration. Let me take a tiny break here. Terry, I need a little t help here. How much time do we have left? Again? Seven minutes. Seven minutes? Okay, we've got seven minutes to go. Are there alternatives that you think are unrealistic in demanding the impossible, but realistic to capitalism? Because that's really what this is all about, isn't it? Isn't it about the fact that, that we're playing Monopoly in our country? Remember Monopoly when you are a kid? You play Monopoly for a couple of days, and no matter how nice you are, how kind you are, how good you are, one person ends up with all the money, right? right? It's the person who got those, you got Boardwalk and Park Place and a couple of others, and if you win those, and if you're lucky enough to win those, you get everything at the end of, after a few days playing. That's capitalism. Whether That's you, right. Even if you don't want to, if you end up owning a whole bunch of stuff, it's going to be a snowball effect That's right. and, and continue, and you're going to get all the stuff. Yeah, the what? logic of capitalism leaves us destroying ourselves. I mean, and we are at now a point with uh, environmental collapse that, that we have a choice and we can either save the earth and find a way to end predatory capitalism, casino capitalism, or we can save capitalism and destroy the earth. And kind of which is it, you know? I look again and again, I find these examples and they drive me kind of crazy. I was driven crazy by Leslie Monvies from CBS when he said, the head of CBS said during the primaries, Donald Trump may be bad for America, but he's good for CBS. Now that's a classic kind of, capitalist way of thinking. It's good for me, so I don't care what happens to the rest of you. Mobile, uh, Exxon Mobil has had the research on man-made climate change for 30 years, it turns out. But why would they share it with the rest of us when they could make an extra nickel? Exactly. This has to end, and the way to end it is to reimagine what's possible. The book's title comes from a phrase, which I like because it's a contradiction, be realistic. Demand the impossible. Che Guevara. Yeah, yes. Che Guevara. But in fact, and James Baldwin echoed it. Baldwin said, 
uh, later he said, uh, the least we can do is demand the impossible. But the, I like the contradiction in that, and I also like the fact that everything I put forward in that book is imminently possible. It's even going on in other parts of the world. So it's not so far-fetched or so crazy, but we think of it as impossible because we're stuck in a debate that we, is not the debate we ought to be having. And so we're given a debate to have, Obamacare versus the healthcare industry, and we want a different debate, free healthcare for yeah. all. And here's an example about young people, because young people are interested in socialism. Who knew? I mean, 10 years ago, socialism wasn't in the discourse, and now it is. And people want to know what it is, and they want to think about it, and they, want, they are actually looking for ways that are alternatives to the system that we don't even name usually. We don't even use the word capitalism. You know it's almost forbidden in academia. So it, so it, socialism or communism, yes, sure. exactly. Except when it comes to the debt. We love to socialize the debt. Exactly. Well, we, but we, my point is that people are interested and, and are thinking about it right now. And of course, the Bernie Sanders campaign opened it up. And I opened it up in the electoral arena. It's, it was already opened up, partly, I think, from Latin America and partly from just the, the increasing concentration of wealth in Occupy Wall Street, pointing at the 1%. I mean, what a brilliant idea. Just once you say the 1%, you've got what's happening, you know. And you see that the rest of us have a lot in common if we could only get together and hold hands, you know. So I think, I think that there are many th steps right now where people are trying to live communally, live, ha have cooperatives, work cooperatively around critical issues like food, for example, uh, in California. And the, this is, I think, very encouraging. I'm and glad I, you mentioned that about food because that is one thing that's happening here in Mendocino County. People are growing food and more and more little farms are starting up and I believe there's a lot more food sharing. Of course, we live in a community where, we, where we've been fishing has been part of this community. That's right. And so there's a lot of their sharing and there's fishing that's going on. You know, we, we are very inspired by our colleagues and comrades in Detroit and many of them started community gardens, and over the next five and 10 years, they became community farms. And so if you go to Detroit now, on the one hand, there's the big picture of a blighted industry and a you know, failing um, uh, you know, steel city and auto city, but it's not true because what you see is a farm growing up amidst the waste. And by, by farm, I mean they grow surplus, and they share it, yes. and they give it away. That is the future. I point in the book to the, uh, the family as a small-scale example that all of us has, have experienced, or most of us have been lucky to experience, and that's a small example of socialism. We don't ask our premature granddaughter to give equal weight into the uh, providing for the family. She just takes, but that's okay because she was born with, you know, with needs, and we all do that. You know, we assume that when we have a family, some will give more than others, but we will do it for the good of all. No matter what condition you come to us in, you will get something. That's a great place for us to end the interview. It brings us full circle because we started talking about your grandchild and grandchildren <laughs> exactly. at the beginning of the interview. The we also accomplished something I asked you to help me accomplish, which we talked about substance and issues. We didn't talk about all the drama and celebratory nature of your earlier political career. Congratulations That's for thank being you, able sir. to thank do you. that. Thank and you, thank Richard. you all so much for listening to today's broadcast of Mind, Body, Health, and Politics. Again, we're talking about Bill Ayers latest book, Demand the Impossible. You're going to want to read it because you want to learn how to demand the impossible. Thank you for listening. Please join us again in exactly two weeks. Until then, this is Dr. Richard Miller reminding you that good health is worth working hard for, and it's essential for life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness.